The Manchester Mark I, which any northerner will tell you was the world's first stored program digital computer. In fact, it was programmable. The difference between the Mark I and ENIAC was that ENIAC was programmed on a patch panel, whereas the Mark I could actually use instructions to modify its code, although obviously that's no longer a really recommended technique. So this is the original um, piece of hardware, which uh, I seem to remember did about a kilo instruction a second, something like that. So it wasn't very powerful. Um, sometime later, what, this is about 30 years later, we've moved on. This is the VAX 11780, and this is actually the machine that defines the MIPS, the million instructions per second. So a dry stone MIPS is basically the amount of integer computing uh, you could do on a VAX 11780. And those of you who've been around long enough know that they were actually much more powerful machines and had lots of software support in them. I think the VAX was the original machine that the BSD operating system uh, was ported to. Uh, so the VAX was one MIPS. Seven years later, you could buy a half MIPS machine with a graphical user interface to sit on your own desktop. And this remorseless progress has continued apace. So now, uh, less than 70 years after the, the Manchester Mark I, in 2015, I came across this little device called the YPI. And this was interesting for two reasons. First of all, it was a chip that had Wi-Fi and Bluetooth hardware on it. But secondly, and most interestingly, it was the first chip I'd come across that you could program natively in Python. And the Python world's moved on in the world of microcontrollers. This is a device called the uh, D1 Mini. Do I have a D1 Mini outside its box? Yes, there we are. So I can just quickly, uh, oh no, it's not, don't worry. We'll look at the real, the real hardware later. So the D1 Mini has an ESP12S, uh, that's an ESP8266 processor in it. It's about the size of a, well, it's a little bit bigger than a postage stamp, and it does uh, about somewhere between 50 and 100 MIPS. Uh, this year, I'm awaiting the delivery of, of a new device called the FiPi, which is a, pro, uh, a, a successor to the YPi. And not only does that do Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it also has LoRa, Sigfox, and uh, cellular hardware inside it. So it's got five different networks on the one chip. And the left-hand diagram there is the uh, development chip for that uh, system. That'll be coming out sometime, I think, before December. On the right-hand side, you can see the uh, ESP32. That's the latest system from Espressif the company who brought us the ESP8266. That has a, it, uh, it, it's an amazing piece of hardware. It has a dry stone MIPS rating of 600 MIPS. So on a piece of silicon, two centimeters square or less, you've got 600 times the power uh, of a VAX 11780. Not only that, you've got an amazing array of hardware available. So there's hardware in there. There are two processors. There's hardware in there to accelerate the computations that you need to do for cryptography to support secure computing. It's got all the RF circuitry in it. It's got uh, serial communications of three different kinds. It can handle infrared. The buttons can be, the pins can be configured to be touch sensitive, analog to digital, and, and digital to analog. So it's a truly capable uh, piece of hardware, a full system on a chip. So where we're going to be in two or three years' time, I don't think anybody really knows. So I'm getting to, towards the end of my career now, and I, I find that my interest in electronics as a hobby subject is coming back quite a bit. But I've been interested in Python for more than uh, 20 years. And in fact, I, I kind of, when I, I first came across Python in, in 1995, I thought, well, clearly this is a great language for doing 
object-oriented programming in it. So what we need to do is, is to um, improve its prospects. So I've been working for 20 years to help to grow Python's uh, communities. And I put in a considerable amount of effort to try and underpin the, software, the Python Software Foundation. Uh, the result uh, hasn't actually been profit for me, but I think a lot of people have, have profited by those efforts. So I'm very happy that I spent the time to do it and that so many other people have uh, felt it was worth their while to do it too. Uh, so here, by the way, is a parenthetical thank you to everybody who's worked so hard to organize Pike on Ireland this year. I know it's not easy. But in March uh, of last year, the BBC had a, a really stupendous announcement. They came out with the, what they see as the logical successor to the BBC Micro, which was probably how many people learned programming on a BBC Micro? Okay, there's a couple in the room. It was a common way to do it back in, in those days. So this micro bit, it's an updated piece of hardware. It uses a, a Cortex M0 processor from ARM. It's got 256K of flash with 16K of RAM. It's got accelerometers and magnetometers built in. It's got uh, wireless connectivity through Bluetooth. And more importantly, uh, this little array of, of insignificant looking dots here is actually a five by five array of LEDs. Now, the really significant thing about this announcement was that they announced at the same time that they were planning to give away one million micro bits so that every second year uh, school student in a particular year, I think it was the second year, I can't honestly remember, but they've given away a million of these micro bits in a single year. So, since my goal has been for, for 20 years to try and put Python into everyone's reach, I was delighted that, that so much computing hardware was, was going to become available. But of course, the micro bit didn't have uh, Python in it at the, at the very, very beginning during the, the planning stages. In fact, a lot of people have worked very hard uh, to put Python in there. So the thing about the, the, the learner environment is when we're talking about learners, we don't need a huge amount of infrastructure support. And particularly when you're dealing with children, one of the important impacts is to be able to give them direct hands-on experience with hardware so that they can see themselves in control of the hardware. And this gives them a great feeling of empowerment and enables experimentation. I very much enjoyed um, Brandon's talk, and certainly um, the stuck state in beginners is something that we, we need to try and help them to overcome. And obviously, one of the ways that we can do that is to give them an easy to play with computing environment. So in other words, we don't need large resources per individual student, but it would be very helpful if we had a large number of devices that those students could use. So a shout out here to Damien George, who is the uh, inventor and original developer of a system called MicroPython, and also to Nick Tolovey, who with a number of other enthusiastic individuals, uh, represented the PSF in developments with the BBC to actually make sure that MicroPython would run on the BBC Micro itself, the, the micro bit itself. So how like Python is it? People often assume, because it's a, a cut-down implementation, that it, it doesn't have all Python's features. You'll, you'll be surprised. It's got the complete Python 3.4 syntax. Uh, the only note is that some uh, early systems and those with limited memory may choose not to implement floating point. Um, and I think the, the YPI is one of those systems that doesn't implement floating point. So it's got most of the standard data types that you would want to use. It's got Python's inherent ability uh, to build classes and, and create instances from them. It's got exception handling and so on. And it even adds the async and await features from uh, 3.5. And optionally, you can convert into machine code as well. There's a wide range of, of supported systems, 
uh, and getting wider all the time. So if, if you deal with a particular microcontroller, you might want to consider your own uh, MicroPython port. It's got a file system with a certain amount of, of EEPROM that appears as the uh, slash flash directory. If you've got hardware support for an SD card, then the card will appear as slash SD. So uh, your current directory is either flash or SD. If you haven't got SD, you'll see flash. If you have got SD, uh, you'll see that. There's an OS module, a very cut down one, nowhere near as capable as the OS module in the uh, standard implementation. But uh, file open works just as it usually does. You can read and write files in binary or text uh, just the way that you can in, in standard Python 3.4. So when you uh, switch this device on, the first thing it does is it looks for a file called boot.py and it runs that. Then it enables its USB interface, and if it exists, another program called main.py will be run. Um, most systems will actually allow a safe boot mode as well, so if you mess up your boot.py, you haven't bricked the device. And most systems will also allow you to reset the file systems to factory settings. It has a paste mode, so if you've got your code in another application, you can just copy it, Enter control E in your interactive session with the device, paste your code in, uh, terminate the entry with control D, and lo and behold, your code gets passed. Uh, installation of MicroPython is extremely easy. Here you can see pretty much everything uh, you need to do. So first of all, download the MicroPython binary. That's the URL for the current 192 binary. Uh, install a tool called ESP tool in your virtual environment, uh, or if you absolutely have to, use sudo and install it on your system in Python, but I'd prefer people didn't do that. And then um, configure your, your ESP tool command. So here I'm just, cr oops, creating an alias, and the alias just makes sure that we use a particular port. And then finally, you use that tool to erase the flash from the device and rewrite the image detecting the flash size from zero. So once the uh, device is loaded, uh, lo and behold, MicroPython is running. Now, MicroPython has been an open source uh, project and it remains that, but there's a company called Xerinth that's actually using their version of MicroPython. They've taken a few liberties, for example, exceptions are integers in Zerin's implementation of MicroPython, but it's essentially still Python and it works just as, as you would expect it to. So uh, they've got a number of interesting features. They can work with all kinds of embedded hardware. They have defined a virtual machine on top of which both MicroPython and C code will run. They've developed a, well, I wouldn't say it was a brilliant, but an acceptable uh, integrated development environment. They've got uh, an advanced device manager living on the internet which you can use to manage your devices and communicate securely with them using certificate-based encryption, which makes your, your IoT systems more secure. And they've got a beautiful little cell phone app which you can connect through the device manager so that items in you know, values in, in variables on your uh, micro Python device can be directly displayed and you can make inputs directly through the application. So, very, very capable uh, system. I've only just recently, in the last month, started to play with Xerinth. I would say that it, it still needs some polishing up, but it's an extremely promising system. And again, wide range of systems available. So they're there, it's got MicroPython on systems that the standard MicroPython uh, won't run on. So uh, you can run up to five devices on a standard system without any licensing at all. After that, costs may, may get involved. So how do you use it? Well, here's how you control digital input and output. The machine library contains a class called PIN, and you can create a pin, it has a pin number, you specify whether it's an input or an output pin. If it's an input pin, 
then you can also specify the configuration of a pull-up resistor so that it will float uh, to high in the absence of any input. Sorry about that. You can read its value with uh, the value method, and you can also set its value by giving the value method an argument. And this is a very common paradigm in MicroPython micro -Python programs. So on the uh, output scene A, you can see that I'm actually configuring a pin for output, and then I can set it or clear it. And in fact, pins usually have an on and an off method as well, but I didn't bother to show you those. So with Flash or SD, you can use open and uh, files just as you normally do in Python. There's even simple networking. This is a horrible piece of code, which I've copied straight out of, out of an example. But you can see that basically what they're doing there is extracting the host and the path uh, from a URL. And then they're getting the address, IP address of the uh, specified host, opening a socket, uh, connecting with that socket to the host, sending an HTTP request, and then just printing what comes back. And now, of course, these devices have Wi-Fi built into them. It's extremely cheap. The standard uh, Wemos D1 Mini now you can buy uh, in the UK from about three pounds up. Now, when you buy those cheap devices, uh, sometimes you will find that you end up dealing with people who are buying end of runs or uh, perhaps inadequately tested systems. So I wouldn't necessarily expect them all to work at that price, but uh, for three quid you can afford to buy quite a few. So you can do uh, control of servo motors if you want. Uh, here we're seeing, the, the nice thing about the servo control is that when you give the motor the control, the, the control, the change actually takes place in the background. So in this particular case, we've got two servos being controlled. Both those servos will execute their motion in the same time period because the uh, time uh, that the movement should take is the second parameter to the angle method of the servo object in PyBoard MicroPython. So there, there's really um, methods for, for almost everything. The thing that I like most of all is I've been writing interrupt handling routines for quite a long time now, and uh, I now, finally, I can write them in Python. So here you can see that I'm configuring two pins for input, and then I configure uh, pin zero so that when it sees a falling edge on its signal, in other words, when the signal goes from high to low, it will go into interrupt mode and the callback function will be called with the pin object that raised the interrupt as the argument. So you can print out its, its value or do whatever you want with it. And the uh, second, the, sorry, the last line on this example uh, specifies that we want an interrupt both on a rise and on a fall. In other words, whenever the pin state changes state, we want to be able to call that, that call back again. So now you've got full control over hardware uh, without any of the nonsense of having to go down into assembly language and learn that. And most systems will also allow you to actually put the system into uh, deep sleep mode so that you can save power. The only thing you have to be careful of is that deep sleep mode will uh, really put the device to sleep. So when it wakes up again on a programmed interrupt, then you actually have to go through all of the initialization again. So you don't want to enter deep sleep mode uh, for really short waits. So we've got interrupt handling and we've got power control. The MicroPython guys have actually created an interface called Unicorn, which allows you to emulate the PyBoard, which is the reference hardware implementation for MicroPython. Uh, it allows you to implement that, and, and here there's an example which actually you, know, you can show a semi, an emulated servo motor moving as you go. I don't think there'll be time to demonstrate that, but it's there, and the URL is in the slides if you want to play with it. So just to give you some idea of how we would use it on uh, real-world problems, for those of you who, who aren't familiar with hardware, switches have a problem. They don't just go on and off, right? When you throw a switch, 
then typically you'll see what's called switch bounds. So we've got a switch that's transmitting a high signal uh, and we want to take it low. And eventually it does go low, but during the, inter the, the intermediate period between the switch being activated and it settling in that low state, it can go high and low several times. Now, clearly, we don't want that because our systems respond very quickly to these things. So what we don't want is when someone throws a switch for the CPU to see that waveform on its input pin and say, ah, OK, so it's off. No, it's on again. No, it's off again. No, it's on again. You want it to just see one clean transition. So being a programmer, I decided that a pure software solution was probably better. There are things you can do with hardware, Schmidt triggers and so on, to make uh, switches more behave more responsibly. But all I thought I would do is, to, well, look, just sample the signal line uh, at regular intervals and regard it as stable when you've seen a certain number of samples which are all the same. And I happen to choose n equals 12 and, and a 6 millisecond sample interval, which means that 72 milliseconds after it, it starts changing plus the, the time, you'll see a response. And generally, um, under 0.1 of a second is, is considered to be acceptable for user interface purposes. So here's the definition by switch class. It takes a, a pin number and a name for the switch as arguments. It initializes the switch's state uh, to zero. It might be better to actually read the pin, but I, at the moment I initialize it to zero. Uh, it sets the value to zero, and then it establishes control over the pin with a call to the pin library, and it stashes its name. And the only other method that the switch has is a little function to return its name if the switch is pressed, or a dot if it's not. So, given that we might want to run several switches and, and they all have timing mechanisms in common, I then went on to define a, a debouncer class. And the debouncer is initial, when, it, when it's initialized, it creates an empty list of switches and it establishes a timer. Now, this isn't actually a, a hardware timer, this is a virtual timer which is run uh, by hardware counting from an internal clock. And I initialize the timer to run periodically. In other words, it's not just one shot. It will keep interrupting. And uh, I've said when it runs, the interrupt when the timer is up will be the tick method of this instance of the debouncer. So in other words, I'm just passing a bound method as the callback for this particular switch to keep it all nice and self-contained. We need to be able to add uh, switches to the switch bank. So here is a register method which simply appends a switch to the list of switches, makes sure it's in the correct input mode, and then it returns the switch uh, in case you want to do something else with it in the same statement. And the debouncer class is finished off with its, the tick method itself. So this is what happens uh, once every six milliseconds. We iterate over all the switches. We take the current value from the pin for this switch. We shift up, sorry, we shift up the current state. So we shift the current state up right one bit and we or uh, the, current, uh, the current value in there. And then we chop off with the and uh, the 13th bit if we happen to have shifted uh, out of it. So then we've got the last 12 zero one samples as 12 bits at the left-hand end of an integer value. So if it's zero, then the switch is pressed and has been for at least 72 milliseconds. And if it's FFF, in other words, if they're all ones, then it's released and, and has been for at least 72 seconds. So the assumption is, of course, by then, uh, bouncing is over and we've, we've got a, a solid value. So if we want to use this, we just uh, create, well, this little switches routine simply takes um, the names of all the switches and reports them. So I'm going to create a bank of four switches, uh, which I then register with the debouncer that I've created. And there's just a simple background task which loops 
infinitely. So it retrieves the switches. And then if the state of all those switches has changed, it records the new state and prints it out. So switch setup's remarkably easy. Uh, let's finish off, if we can, with a live demonstration, because it's always fun to see things go wrong, as it almost inevitably will. But what I'm doing now, I've got here a little box uh, which implements four buttons, uh, which are connected to four separate pins. So I'm actually going to be running uh, the code that I was just showing you. Here it is inside my uh, software development environment. I happen to use uh, Wing. And let me see, I should have a terminal window somewhere. There we go, right, okay. So let me make that a little bigger so that you can see what's going on. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use a program called Screen to give me a connection to the serial port that the MicroPython device is running, which I happen to know is dev tty.wch usb serial 1410 and i also happen to know that we need to go at 115,200 bits per second well that's reassuring uh, we've got a python prompt now one thing i didn't mention or did i mention is yeah we've got paste mode so all i need to do now is go into paste mode go back to my development environment Select all that code and copy it. Go back to my MicroPython session, paste the code in, and type Control D, and the code is now running. Of course, it's not doing anything because there's been no action, but hopefully, if I press the yellow button here, we actually see a Y. If I release it, we see that the Y disappears. So every time one or more buttons is pressed, you can see that we're getting records of the change state. So uh, I've actually got four buttons on this thing. I'm taking suggestions for what to do with those buttons, and the four most interesting suggestions uh, will be implemented and uh, published as part of the, the code that uh, I've got going on a, a GitHub site. So obviously, there's all kinds of things we could do with MicroPython. Robot control and, and toys and games are things that clearly will interest kids. If you want to get them interested in geographical type stuff, get them to make a weather station. If you want them to play with lights, there are now devices called NeoPixels that allow you to uh, vary brightness and color over a huge arrays of display. And of course, it's a great way, <coughs> if you've got any scientific experiments, uh, to collect data and to, to instrument your projects. And I've been a, a big believer that the, the interesting part of computing to me isn't the numerical side at all, it's the symbolic stuff. Uh, MicroPython means that children can get direct hands-on experience which puts them in control of what's going on. And the younger they start, then the more able they will be later in life to apply the programming that they've learned uh, to other subjects, like history, for example, or in supposing people still teach history in the future. <laughs> okay, so um, we don't want to take too long. I do have a number of pieces of hardware with me. If anybody wants to play with MicroPython, I can probably lend you enough hardware uh, to get started. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to handle them, but thank you very much for listening. Do we have time for questions, David? Or would you rather move on? I, I think, uh, uh, well, okay, I'll take time to, to one question. So one question, yeah. The micro Python world and, and all that happened to have played around with the micro bit, but it was a world of limited dimension when I played with that, and I moved to the Arduino world, which is huge as well. So I know it's a Python conference, of course. Yep. But how do you say, is there a compilation between the two or competition between the Arduino world and the micro Python? Okay, so just to summarize for those who, who weren't able to hear, the question is, uh, having tried MicroPython, uh, this gentleman found that the, the Arduino world was much richer. So th there are two reasons for that, I think. One is that the, the Arduino development environment's been going, what, about 10, 15 years now, so it's much more mature. Um, and 
I think that, that's actually probably the essence of it. But there is, as far as I'm concerned, no competition between those two. It's simply that Python is so much easier to learn than C that I think it would make a much better starting point. And uh, the integration that there is between MicroPython and C in the Xerin system is something that I hope we'll see reflected more, more broadly in the world. So no, I, I don't think that Arduino and MicroPython uh, need inherently conflict. And in fact, uh, Arduino hardware is now being targeted by MicroPython implementations as well. Yes? You mean, do I know who's using MicroPython in, in production devices? I'm sorry, I'm not terribly familiar with that end of the, the market, but I know from reading on the forum that there are a lot of people who are thinking of doing it. So the, the people on the MicroPython forum are not all hobbyists by any manner or means. So I imagine it will be only a matter of time before we see MicroPython appearing pervasively in embedded systems. Looks like we're done. Thank you very much. <laughs>